Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. This week's chapel speaker was Dr. Chip Pollard. Dr. Pollard has been the president of JBU since 2004. Prior to coming to JBU, he taught English at Calvin College and practiced law in Chicago. Good, good morning. Good morning. Please feel free to make your way down again. We have seats in front. We also have seats up in the cathedral, I mean up in the balcony if you want to come. Uh, welcome back. It's been over 17 months since we've gathered together to worship inside, and I'm glad that we're back together. I know that it's not exactly right because we have about a third of our students over in the BPAC, but we're heading in the, in the right direction. We're studying the Gospel of Mark this semester, and I'm going to be reading from the first eight chapters of chapter one. So please join me in listening to the Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching repentance and the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to see him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. The thongs of his sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The opening lines of stories often shape our ex expectation for what will be in the narrative. For example, some of you may remember the famous opening lines of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. After reading this line, you know that this story is going to be about the intrigue of rich men and clever women trying to figure out if they should get married. In other words, Jane Austen's novel is a highly articulate and morally upright 18th century version of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Mark also tells us about his gospel in these opening lines. It particularly focuses on how John the Baptist prepares the way of the Lord, prepares people to accept Jesus as the Messiah. It's this theme of preparing the way of the Lord that I think is particularly apt for us today. Lord willing, we are slowly coming out of this pandemic. And it's been 17 months of great disruption to our normal lives. We've spent a lot of time internally focused on keeping ourselves and our loved ones safe. We've grieved what we have lost, and including some in our community have grieved the loss of loved ones. We've been frustrated by the limitations in life. We've been at times isolated, lonely, anxious, and depressed. And right now, we have pent-up expectations for the future, for an end to restrictions, for a return to better times. To an even greater extent, Mark's original audience, the Jewish people in the first century Palestine, found themselves longing for better times. The Jews had not heard directly from God for over 400 years. Malachi was the last time they had a prophet. And they had lived under Roman occupation for 100 years. In short, they found themselves conquered and oppressed, and they were wondering if God had forgotten them. They placed all of their hope in this future of the Messiah coming, the deliverer that the prophets had talked about for ages. And they knew there would be a forerunner who would come before the Messiah, so they were looking for him first. When John the Baptist began to preach and baptize near the Jordan River, the people took notice and they wondered, is God moving again? I believe the story of Mark's, Mark's story of John the Baptist has something to teach us today as we anticipate our future, as we long for new beginnings, as we consider how we might prepare the way for Jesus to come. Three main points for the sermon this morning. First, what is the way of the Lord? Second, how did John prepare the Jewish people for the way of the Lord? And third, how should we be prepared for the way of the Lord? 
In short, Mark argues that the way of the Lord has always been about God setting up power to do a rescue plan to save his people. First, Mark references Exodus 23, 20, which says, God promises to send his angel ahead of the people of Israel to guard them along the way to bring you to a place that I prepared for you. Second, he alludes to Malachi 3.1, which repeats some of the same language. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And then third, Mark quotes from Isaiah 43. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for God. Notice the three historical contexts for each of those quotes. First, Mark cites the Exodus, where God leads the people of Egypt, people, of, people out of slavery in Egypt to their rightful home in the promised land. Second, he referenced Malachi, the last time that God has spoken to the people of Israel, when he promised a new Elijah would be the forerunner who would come to prepare the way for the Messiah. And then third, the allusion is to Isaiah, when God is predicting the return of the Jews who are being held captive in Babylon, Babylon to their home in Judah. You can see the pattern that Mark is suggesting. The way of the Lord is the same in the Exodus, in the exile, and now in the coming of the Messiah. The way of the Lord is about taking his people from exile back to home, from slavery to freedom, from despair to hope, from being lost to being found, from being a refugee to being a citizen, from death to life. With these three brief Old Testament allusions, Mark is setting John the Baptist and Jesus in the center of the whole story of Scripture. God's way is to redeem his people. Mark is signaling to his audience that God is moving again, that he will rescue his people, that he will repair the ruins that were caused by their disobedience, that he will restore his rule, and he will lead his lost children home. However, unlike the exodus or the exile, this time it's different. God is not sending Moses or Elijah or Nehemiah or the prophets. He's sending his son. He's not going to restore the earthly kingdom, Israel. He's going to establish a heavenly kingdom on earth. He's not just rescuing the Jewish people, but he's providing a way for all people. He's not just going to respond to the results of sin. He's going to fix the problem of sin once and for all. The way of the Lord is always God's deepest expression of his love for us because the way of the Lord is always his way of salvation. So second point, how does John the Baptist prepare his audience for this way of the Lord? Now, I was born in 1963. So when I first started to hear about John the Baptist, I was like eight or nine years old, which is like 1969 or like 1971. So I always thought John the Baptist was the hippie of the Bible. He wore camel hair and had a leather belt. He ate weird food, locusts and wild honey, and he lived out in the wilderness. I had an older cousin who, wear, who wore bell-bottom jeans all the time, was a vegetarian for a while, and then drove to California in a milk truck and made that her home for a while. That was my image of John the Baptist, a hippie. I'm only eight or nine, give me credit. All right. However, Mark provides all these details not to suggest that John is somehow countercultural, but to specifically connect him to Elijah. They both dress alike. They have camel hair and leather belts. They both live and preach in the wilderness. They both preach a message of repentance, and they both stood up to kings. In Malachi 4, the last chapter of the Old Testament, God predicts that the prophet Elijah will come before the Messiah comes. And Mark is clearly describing John the Baptist as a fulfillment of that uh, prophecy. So you can see how Mark's setting up his gospel. The Bible ends, the Old Testament ends with a promise that Elijah's coming, and his gospel begins with John the Baptist as a fulfillment of that promise. This is the continuation of the story. Both Elijah and John preach a message of repentance as a means for people to get ready for the way of the Lord. But John adds this practice of baptism. It's not just repentance. He says, repent and be baptized. And we should take a moment to see why. As John makes really clear at the end of this passage, his baptism is different than the Christian baptism that happens after the death and resurrection of Christ. John baptizes with water, where Christian baptism includes the presence and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism is much more like the tradition that was happening at that time when Gentiles converted to, Jude to uh, Judaism. So when a Gentile became a Jew, he or she would take part in three rituals. They'd have a water baptism, they'd have temple sacrifices, and for men, there would be circumcision. 
It was a serious commitment to become a, for a Gentile to become a Jew. But Jews did not have to be baptized because they were already part of God's people by way of birth. So what's really remarkable about John's preaching at the beginning of Mark was that he wasn't talking to Gentiles. He was actually talking to Jews. He was calling all Jewish people to repent and be baptized in order to get ready for the Messiah to come. He was saying to the Jewish audience that you really can't be part of God's rescue plan just because of your birth. That like the Gentiles, you need to be willing to repent of your sins and publicly acknowledge that you are following God to prepare the way of the Messiah. Now, I don't know about you, but for me that's a really convicting word. See, because I grew up my whole life in a Christian family. I became to Christ at a very young age, at seven. I've lived what I think is a mostly good life. Like the Jews of John's time, I don't always like to recognize that I have sin in my life. I don't always want to see my need to repent. I think sometimes I'm secure in the momentum of my good life. But John looks at me and says, no, you too need to repent and acknowledge your way before the Lord in order to prepare the way of the Lord. Augustine describes sin as fundamentally our, dis- our tendency to be curved in on ourselves rather than being directed outward to others or to God. By which he means that human beings so easily take everything in their experience and try to make it benefit themselves. Try to make it be about their status. And we just do it naturally. It's the way we are bent. We don't give thanks to God first when we have gifts of intelligence or athleticism or beauty. We think it's because of our own efforts and we take pride in it. We're curved in on ourselves. We enter into relationships and if we're really honest, because they bring us joy, not for us to bring somebody else joy or they help our status. We serve other people so that we can be known as good people. We know this, we make fun of people in order to create an inside group and have somebody be on the outside. We hoard our time, our money, our affection because we're afraid sometimes that they'll run out and we won't have enough for ourselves. We take the good gift of food and turn it into gluttony. The good gift of sex and turn it into pornography. The good gift of friendship and turn it into a clique. We are turned in on ourselves. Let me make it even more personal. I will tell you, I love being the president of John Brown University. I am so grateful that God has given me this opportunity to use my gifts, to be with students. Uh, But I also know I'm curved in on myself, that sometimes I love that people know that I'm the president of JBU. I love that people sometimes compliment me about how I'm doing the job. I love that you laughed and chuckled at my video because it makes me feel like I'm still relevant. (laughs) Too often I find my worth in my job rather than my relationship to Christ. Too often I actually ignore those closest to me, like Carrie, because I'm too busy thinking about work. Too too often, particularly in the last 17 months, I imagine I actually can control what happens on this campus to stop a pandemic. That's the silliest thing anybody ever thought of, instead of praying for God's protection for this place. Now Carrie often helps me with my sin of selfishness. So even as I was writing this uh, sermon, there's a little post-it note on my computer screen. And she's had that there pretty much my whole 18 years, different versions of this. It says, I still love you, and remember, it's not about you. Pride and self-centeredness is a besetting sin in my life for which I need to repent. We are curved in on ourselves, and John the Baptist calls us to repent so that we can prepare for the way of the Lord. If we repent, God will be faithful to forgive. It's part of his way. It's part of his rescue pan. Repent needs to become a habit in our lives so that it becomes, shapes our character and then that godly character will enable us to enjoy God's good gifts. It will enable us to think of others first. It will enable us to think about God first. As C.S. Lewis says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. In other words, humility is not thinking badly about yourself or being self-deprecating. It's just thinking about yourself less. Having less of your mind being occupied about your own needs. If we can train ourselves to think of ourselves less, we make room to think about others more and more about. Repent means to turn in a new direction 
So at the beginning of this semester, what sorts of ways might we consciously think about choosing to turn in a new direction? Turn away from the things that make me think about myself and turn towards God and others. So, a couple examples. How about in our political and cultural conversations? Perhaps we can turn away from clever insults, from mischaracterizing our opponent's arguments to make them look ridiculous, from triggering the other person to get mad enough that they use all caps in responding to you. You know you've got them when they start using all caps, right? Or from tagging our friends to gang up on our opponent. We could turn first to listen to others, to actually thinking about what's the best in their argument, not what's the worst. To discipline ourselves not to get angry, to seek to be kind, and maybe to offer in person, to meet in person to talk about it. How about our relationships with other people? Repent from avoiding somebody who's different than ourselves because you know it's gonna be an uncomfortable conversation. Instead, maybe be curious and respectful as you learn from people that have different experiences. Repent, and this is a hard one, I know, particularly when you're new here. Repent from spending a lot of time finding other people to go with you to the calf so that you won't be alone. And maybe choose to go to the calf alone and look for somebody that's sitting alone by a table and sit with that person. Repent from creating a study group that just makes your life easier. Instead, maybe create a study group in which you can meet new people. And how about our relationship to God? maybe repent from being disappointed that God did not answer our prayer in our way and turn towards thanking him for so many ways he's blessed us. Repent maybe from our, and I do this all the time, our constant complaining about the pandemic and actually turn towards recognizing the joys that we've had in the last 17 months that would not have otherwise happened. Repent from our indifference to reading the word towards joining a Bible study. Repent from criticizing church or chapel to giving thanks that we can gather again to worship him. And John just doesn't say repent. He says repent and be baptized. Which again, given the difference between John's baptism and Christian baptism, doesn't mean as you go out of the chapel to dunk yourself in the fountain on your way out, okay? I know it's hot, but that's not a good idea. Instead, it suggests making some sort of public acknowledging that we are turning and following Jesus again. That public acknowledgement may be a quiet conversation with uh, your roommate or a teammate or your girlfriend or boyfriend. It may be something more public, like with your suite or with your group of friends or with your family. It may be a commitment you make to a faculty member about class or to your leadership team in the cause ministries. Let somebody know about your specific thing that you're trying to turn away from. It's a really good thing. The power of combining repentance and public acknowledgement is wonderful for a community. It gives you accountability and it encourages your friends. It deepens friendship and community in our, in our area so that we might think about ourselves less and think more often of God. And it prepares us for the way of the Lord. And ultimately, that is what we should strive to do. Prepare ourselves for the way of the Lord. Pre- prepare ourselves for Christ's return. Someday, the pandemic will be over. But we'll still have illness and death. Someday, we will end fighting about masks and vaccines but we'll still have strife in our relationships. Someday the situation in Afghanistan will be resolved, but we'll still have wars. And someday we will recover from the latest fire or hurricane, but we'll still have natural disasters. In this time between Christ's first coming as Messiah and his second coming as a king, we live in the world of already but not yet. His kingdom has begun but is not fully here. We see glimpses of his healing and his rule, but we also see large examples of his brokenness, of the brokenness and sin. We capture moments of joy when relationships are good, but we experience the ache of disappointment in even the best relationships. In fact, even though I've already proven abundantly clear that I have not an expert in social media, I do wonder if what people post on social media actually reflects our deep desire for the good of the new heaven and the new earth for the world that we will have when Christ finishes his work. Social media as evidence of heaven, but you haven't heard that very many times. We all long to have perfect bodies that don't get ill and sick and die. Great friendships, deeply loving families, great experiences in the natural world, meaningful work. We long to be known, to be seen, to be liked and to be loved. It seems to me about 90% of the posts I see that's what it is about. 
And that's actually not a bad thing. It's our longing for the new heaven and the new earth where all those things will become true. However, you also know and you experience yourself that it is an engine of comparison, social media. And that comparison almost always robs us of joy because it reflects the the distance between what we really want and what our life is actually like. The ache of that gap between the ideal and real is heartbreaking and triggers our anxiety and loneliness. I, too, I don't do a lot with this, but I do this summer, had that experience myself. On Father's Day, I noticed that all my nephews and nieces were posting pictures of themselves with, you know, my brothers and brother, brothers-in-law, their fathers, with really nice captions about the relationships. Now, all my kids called me on Father's Day, and we had nice conversations, and they loved me very much, but they didn't post anything. And suddenly, in the middle of the afternoon on that day, I felt the sting of comparison and the sense of self-doubt. I expect that you have too. How to respond? We can repent and turn away from that cycle of comparison in order to think less about ourselves. We can repent and turn away to thinking about ourselves and focus on the gifts of others. We can repent and turn towards God, knowing that Christ is the only one that can prepare the way of the Lord. For in the end, it is only in Christ that we can be presented to God, holy and without blemish or fault. In the end, the only filter that's going to matter will be whether you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. The only light, lighting that will count will be the brilliance of Christ's glory eclipsing all of our failures. The only poses that will matter will be Christ on the cross and standing outside the tomb. The only friend that we will need will be Jesus. It's only in Christ's return that the way of the Lord will become a full reality in our life. In the meantime, we prepare for that coming again by faithfully, selflessly, and repeatedly repenting and following him. Repent and follow Jesus. That'd be a good way to start the semester and every semester here at JBU. May it always be true of us at JBU. Amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on, and we'd love it if you would leave us a review.